So uh, welcome everyone, hello. Uh, my name is Radek Olszewski and I'm super happy to be here uh, today with you. Uh, I admit in my life, I've never been to Lithuania, which is a sad thing because we are neighbors in the end. So I'm super happy to hear that you have such a vivid agile community. Uh, yeah, this is totally not planned, but after listening about all these events that Limonas just presented, uh, yeah, feel welcome to come to Agile by example to Warsaw or another conference that we have. I think there'll be a benefit from uh, people flowing in, in both directions. Um, I don't want to speak too much about myself. Uh, you can probably find me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's the best way to approach me. Uh, what I do professionally on top of uh, yeah, doing, uh, I don't know, Kanban training or speeches like this, uh, I work with organizations trying to find, uh, I would say, the best way for them to uh, sort out how to how to work smarter, how to uh, work in more more agile way. Um, so it's not only limited to Kanban, uh, but as Limonas and the title, uh, I would say, put the, the threshold quite high, I will try to talk to you about uh, the proper Kanban. And uh, let's uh, let's start with, um, let's just say, the way how we could uh, try to sell ideas to our colleagues, right? Because I assume that many people in this group are either Scrum Master, Agile coaches, any kind of formal, informal change agents. And uh, yeah, it's it's good to know how to explain why our colleagues, our coworkers, our managers, stakeholders, even customers should be interested in, in using some Kanban uh, practices. So um, I don't want to do it this way that uh, I will give you the examples like, you know, yeah, how to design the perfect Kanban board or um, yeah, uh, let's do the four hours, four hours long workshop with, with policies writing next, next week with your team. Um, or um, how to buy a better tooling for flow metrics. We know there are many of them. Um, or three new types of meetings. Yeah, we know people hate meetings, so that's not the way to go. Um, it's it's not also good to say if you if you want to understand Kanban, you need to understand statistics. So don't talk to me before you don't finish the statistics uh, training on Coursera. Yeah, that's that's not the way to sell ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, be relieved. There won't be any test from the Kanban practices uh, tonight. So no, no reason to stress. Um, but why, why sh I show this picture is that very often I see that, you know, we hear at the conference, at the training that we are about the practice, about the metric, and we come to the team, we come to the organization and we try to tell them, hey, this is the way to do it. Yeah, or this is the thing to do. Um, I would like us tonight to focus on a little bit different approach. So what problems Kanban really tries to solve? And uh, I would say if we will figure it out that some of the problems that I'm going to talk about actually resonate with you, with your work environment, then maybe that's the better way to, to talk about uh, proper Kanban. What do we start with? Uh, today we will see these three people uh, quite often. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a specialist. This could be a software engineer, this could be a, um, I don't know, a designer, this could be even a recruiter, someone not from IT strictly. And on the right hand side, we have a manager, we see that he has a headache. And then there's this uh, smart, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I know it's recording and streaming, I shouldn't use bad words, but this is the, the smarty uh, who is the agile coach yeah, at the bottom. So um, one problem that I keep hearing about in many organizations is that people, especially specialists, don't like to be constantly asked about the progress of work. Yeah? So Laimonas, what's up with the task I gave you two days ago? Yeah, We know that this kind of message, this kind of question comes uh, on Slack, Zoom, whatever you use, exactly when you're focused on something. Uh, that's the Murphy's Law, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, managers, leaders uh, hated that uh, their work is, I would say, reduced to chasing people for information. You know, all they do all day long is basically looking like, oh, how do I report the progress of the project or the you know, uh, readiness for release of my product to, to my steering committee? And why is it like that? Well, uh, it's super simple, but it's uh, not visible. Why? Because we do the invisible work. We do the intangible work. Yeah? So what we do, all of us, I assume, is that most of the day we spend in front of our computers, either at homes or in the offices occasionally. 
And what we do is, well, we think we basically translate our ideas into designs, into codes. Um, we talk at the meetings, we take decisions which are also invisible for most of the time. Yeah? Sometimes, but by the end of the, let's just say, um, yeah, product building, we, we see it, uh, but uh, for quite some time, it's, it's not visible. And it's a big challenge because as you may know, Kanban um, comes from Japan. Kanban originally comes from a Toyota production system where you can see the world, right? So if you've ever been to a factory, if you've ever been to, I don't know, a distribution center, uh, you could say, well, it's not trivial, but I can see the work. I can see who is not doing anything. I can see who is overwhelmed with work. Um, I, I see if there are like, you know, some empty runs on the conveyor belt and, and maybe we, you know, consume electricity or, or fuel, but we don't produce anything. Yeah? What we do is a little bit different. Our domain looks like this. We see people. And if I would ask you now, what do these people work on? Well, you could have multiple answers and many of them could be right. Could they work on a software game? Probably. Could they work on, I don't know, uh, some military project as well? Could they work on e-commerce software? Sure. Yeah. So we don't know because it's not visible. It's not a factory. We don't see if they produce cars or something else. If you are a team member in the setup, if you are a leader or a manager in this setup, uh, you unlikely have a full picture of the work just like that. So what do you do? Well, you ask questions or even worse, you ask for a meeting or even worse, you ask people to fill in some report by end of the day. <laughs> That's not something that you like to see. This is a lot of micromanagement. Um, and we also don't see who is working on what so easily. That's even worse if we work in the remote or hybrid uh, environment, because maybe some years ago it was super easy to, well, just turn around in a chair and ask, uh, hey, Kestutis, do you know how to fix it? Yeah, I, I could see my friend next to me, right? And and yeah, he he rolls on his chair next to me and, and we resolve this problem. Yeah, and uh, now it's not so easy, right? Because I finish one task, I go to unload my dishwasher at home, I sit in front of computer again, and I think to myself, what to do? Well, the, uh, the usual thing is like, I'm gonna start something new because it's easier. Yeah, it's less energy required than, than to fix uh, a bug together or to, to ask for help. And uh, here we are, this is the challenge that we see that we don't see the work. And the first answer that Kanban gives us is uh, visualize the work. Yeah, make the work that it's intangible, make the work which is hidden in our brains, in our mailboxes, in our JIRAs, in our code repositories, visible. And uh, the, the easiest way to do it is to visualize with, with cards, with tickets, if you like to call it, and put them all together on the board. Yeah? So put them in some kind of visualization um, that it's shared and that we can trust. Because of course, if you don't update the visualization, you won't reduce the number of questions. Yeah, you will do the double work, but probably you won't um, save uh, yourself and others energy and frustration. And this is the problem that uh, this is the definition that many people know. I haven't asked it, but I believe if I would ask you in the beginning, like, yeah, have you ever heard about Kanban board? Probably I would see lots of hands raised. Um, but the problem is that many people finish or end their understanding of what is Kanban with the definition of a noun called board. Yeah? So let's go, uh, let's go a little bit further. Um, we see these three people again, and the specialist is saying, I keep juggling with work. There's too much of it. Yeah? I, I don't know what to do. And then there's a manager who says like, hmm, I have so many projects, so many stakeholders, so many uh, emails to answer. I have no clue what to do first. And, uh, you know, one smart S could come, I use this word again, uh, and say, well, follow the priorities. Yeah, but if everything is priority one, it's not easy to follow them, right? Like if everything is urgent, then nothing is urgent, right? That's that's not the way to go. So. Again, the, 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 the Agile coach comes and say, well, why is it like that? So, or he asks actually, why is it like that? And um, we say that multitasking exists only in 
bad job advertisements. Yeah. So if we if we read the job description and we hear like, oh, uh, this is a job for someone who works uh, under pressure uh, and stress uh, uh, really well, and he or she can handle multiple tasks or multiple projects. Uh, yeah, if we have a little bit of professional experience, we rather don't want to work in such an environment. So, so let's leave it behind us. And um, what Kanban has to say about it? Well, do you remember our board? Uh, unfortunately, now it looks like this. What's the difference? If you remember the picture from several uh, seconds ago, you see that now it's cluttered with a lot of tasks. And you know now there's this usual question, how many tasks can you put on a Jira or a Trello board? Any limit? Anyone knows what's the technical maximum? I, I, I don't, and I don't, I, I assume there is none, yeah? If you know, just feel free to write it in chat, feel free to speak up, yeah? Um, the problem is that if we, if we add all of these tasks, uh, the situation becomes even harder. And this is the biggest, uh, I would say, difference that we need to learn. And if there's one message that I want you to take away from tonight is that whenever you hear a person, I want to do Kanban or a team saying like, we do Kanban, then we should ask a question in response. Are you just having a Kanban board or do you work with Kanban system? A Kanban system, which is a pool system, system which respects that you may be busy with something and what you do is basically to focus. And, and this focus is, uh, is coined as this Kanbanish mantra, stop starting, start finishing. Yeah? It's not about our busyness. It's not about you know, pretending to be a senior because you have 20 tasks on your account in Jira. No, it is about uh, what do we finish? Yeah? What do we deliver? What do we uh, accomplish? And uh, it's not only about teams because I work with organizations who meet, for example, you mentioned OKRs in the beginning. Um, that's a good example. We have many goals in our OKRs or we have uh, quarterly business reviews. I don't know if you, if you heard about such term, but I know banks, big organizations, they like to plan work, uh, I would say quarterly. And uh, they don't uh, reflect, uh, okay, how much people actually work in this particular column? How many people work in here? And they don't try to limit it to a reasonable amount of time, uh, amount of, of tasks or regroup them. The consequence is that if they look at their work at the very high level, we see a situation which is absolutely not limiting work in progress, yeah? uh, which looks like this. So um, in some financial organizations I've been working with, they, they have, for example, these kind of bars. And uh, yeah, what do you expect the colors to mean? So if, if, uh, if you are wondering uh, the blue one, it's like the number of initiatives or the projects that they wanted to have done in a quarter. Uh, the yellow is the number of the initiatives or the projects that they started in this quarter. Why they are so close to each other in, in, in the, you know, the height of the bars? Because, well, we are just told to start something, even though we know that there's no capacity to work on it. So the consequence is that, well, the number of delivered finished initi initiatives is a small fraction of what we are busy with. Um, and Kanban is also an approach which, which suggests to stop or to drop the wishful thinking. Yeah? If, if your quarter by quarter looks like this, then without changing the way of work, what's, what's the chances that it will look differently in a quarter from now? So we say, Limit work in progress, focus if you like, yeah, because maybe limit is a bad word in our, uh, has a bad connotation in our language, right, in our dictionary. So simply focus, focus, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to accomplish? The first challenge that we see is that in many organizations which are no longer agile greenfield, I come and I hear from people, oh, I hate these endless meetings. I hate these uh, never-ending uh, discussions. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, reporting that happens. And I know that the font may be really small in here, but what these people say in here is just reporting busyness. 
yesterday I've done this. That's even good if they say that I've done something, but they very often say, well, yesterday I had two meetings in the other projects and then I attended two recruitment uh, meetings with candidates for our team, which means just one thing, they were busy, they generated cost, but it's not equal to delivering or being focused on something that, that actually makes sense. And again, it raises, I would say, even more, um, you know, unclear situation because the managers is like, everyone's busy, but nothing is done. So what am I gonna say at the steering committee <laughs> with the stakeholders that I have on Monday? Yeah, I, again, I have no clue. And, and why is it like that? Because in many reports, in many meetings, in many opportunities that, that we uh, use, uh, but waste, is we report busyness. We talk about how important we are, how busy we are, how overworked we are, instead of managing the flow of work. So what Kanban has to say uh, in order to, to manage the flow of work? Well, look at the board again. And we say, we would like to manage the flow of work on this board. How do we do it? If you see a board like this, what is the first thing that you see on this board? Anyone willing to write? Anyone willing to speak up? Red sticky. Red sticky. Okay, that's a good already because I would say usually people look on the left hand side and they say, I see even more work to do. Yeah, which is, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, probably right, but it's dangerous, right? Because, uh, yeah, we always have some, some more, more work to do. Some of this is the red work. Um, but uh, what we should focus on is again finishing. How do we do it? Well, we manage the flow of work instead of micromanaging people. Yeah? We don't want to micromanage people and ask, you know, how many working hours you spend today. If you're a full-time employee, it's a, it's a fixed cost. It doesn't make the difference, yeah? Mm, what we would like to do is to walk this board from right to left. Why from right to left? Anyone? Stop starting, start finishing. Absolutely. And Kestutis, you're right. Where is the finishing happening? Well, the finishing is happening here on the right-hand side. Yeah? So this is probably the most expensive tickets that you have on the board because the customers are waiting for the longest time. Yeah, many specialists like, I don't know, designers, front-end, back-end people, testers invested their time, uh, but it's still not something that you can send an invoice for. So it's still just a hypothetical value, right? Um, what we would like to do is, yeah, focus on this red item. Yeah, Limonas was right. Why is this red? Yeah, if, if colors mean something, then it shouldn't be uh, neglected. But maybe there is a ticket which is not red, but uh, one of the team members says, I have a problem with it. It's not blocked yet, but someone has a problem and we are, you know, professional uh, human beings so maybe we should swarm around this ticket, yeah? Swarm like ants or bees, so work together on it, yeah? Don't make the pair programming or mob programming like a Yeti, yeah, or Chupacabra. Everyone heard about it, no one's seen it, yeah? So that's, <laughs> that's not the way we wanna go. Um, and yes, in the end, we have some tasks on the left-hand side. This is some work to be, uh, to be done, but uh, yeah, we should reflect if this is the right moment to pull this work into progress, yeah? because that's not, uh, that is the decision that, that we could take. But uh, yeah, if we, I would say, treat our work seriously, if we respect customers, we, we shouldn't say yes to everything. It doesn't mean like we won't do it, but we clearly know that starting so many times at the same time, uh, at the same time, it's not going to help. It's going to, it's going to basically, I would say, fool our customers because we're going to put it on the board and nothing's going to happen, and we're going to fool ourselves that yeah, we are working on something, yeah, we're busy with something. That's not always right. So what Kanban proposes is focus on the flow metrics, not the metrics of busyness, but metrics of how does the work flow? The awareness of work in progress age. So how old is work? Again, if you would be in a 
physical good manufacturing, if you would be working in the food industry, no one reasonable would say, you know, I have a truck of fresh fruits and I'm going to put it on a side of a highway for two weeks and come back later. Yeah? <laughs> because that would be disastrous. You would have uh, a, a big problem. You would have even additional cost of, you know, uh, I don't know, any kind of trashing it or, or uh, utilization of, 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 of the waste, yeah? And we have a fake belief that if I put the task on hold and I come back to it two weeks later, I will know what's been done. No, you probably won't. And probably there will be new dependencies, uh, which will suggest that you will, well, the best thing to do is, is simply, you know, just trash it and start from scratch. And one thing which I know that has in Kanban quite stiff, maybe bureaucratic sound name, which means explicit policies. Oh, what are these explicit policies? I would like to focus today on two examples. One is classes of service. We don't treat all tickets the same way. Just like you don't treat passengers at the airport the same way. As I was saying to, to today, I'm actually in Spain, Valencia. I came here with the plane and, you know, I paid extra money to be treated faster on the airport because I'm traveling with my kids and, you know, kids are not patient. Yeah. Our customers, some of our customers are also not patient. So maybe they should pay more. Yeah? <laughs> pay more, which is not good, which is not bad if you know that you have options, yeah? that you have options to treat one customer, one type of request a little bit different. It doesn't need to be always about money. Yeah? It could be about uh, risks. It could be about um, speed of validating different hypotheses. Uh, the reason why we would treat one ticket different than the other, this is very contextual. For many businesses, it's, it's different. But another, I would say, myth, which uh, is related to Kanban, is that yeah, we know it's just sprintless scrum. So if there is no sprint, it's done when it's done. No. Um, we would like to optimize the flow of certain work items, certain type of tickets. And what helps us to do it is having a clear pool policy. So Laimona said the first thing that he sees on the board is the red sticky. I agree with him. In our culture code, the red usually means something bad or something urgent. So it should be reflected in the pool policy. What is the pool policy? Well, the pool policy means that if you even work in Scrum, and you just started the sprint and you have some of the tickets which are red, then probably you should pull red first instead of pulling something that is easy, something that you like. Yeah? You should do the most painful, the most risky, the most expensive uh, thing first. Yeah? And uh, this is again, a kind of myth that, well, I do just anything to be busy and I call it Kanban. No, that's not the way to do it. So let's meet these three people again for the last time tonight. And let's try to find the answer to the most uh, often question asked by business in the world. The specialist says, oh, they keep asking me about these estimates. I have no freaking clue how long it will take. I have no idea because this is the first time I do something like this. Okay. Um, then there's this manager who says, I have a headache from these story points. I, I have no clue what are these story points. I mean, I've tried to find the Excel, some formula to, to you know, translate, to <laughs> recalculate story points to, uh, to hours or man days, and, and it's not in there. How do I do it? Well, that's of course uh, the wrong usage of story points, uh, but maybe there's just a different things that we could use. So, if I would ask any of you how long it will take to analyze a given task, you could give me an estimate, like it's gonna take me three days, great. I could ask a, another person in the team how long it will take to develop it. And he or she may be right saying, yeah, it's similar to the things that I've done in the past, it's gonna take three days. And uh, then I asked myself, I've been tested for many years by myself, I'm quite confident that's going to take two days. You know, what's the 
what's the most common asked question by the business in the world? Anyone? Why does it take so long? Ah, okay, about the time, yeah? So how long it will take? Yeah, you already have uh, some kind of protection like Monas that it's taking too long. I mean, first I would like to understand how long, yeah? And there's a very dangerous thing happening here because the question how long it will take is not the same as the question when will it be done? When will I have it done? Yeah? Um, in, uh, yeah, behavioral economics, we call it heuristic. We, we, we basically swap questions and we give the answer to the question that we know, presenting as the answer to a totally different question. So what, what, what will happen in this case is probably something like this, that the person who said that it will take three days to analyze was completely, uh, maybe was not completely off the rate of, of the target because we see that we added fourth yellow box. So it took a little bit longer but uh, in between, he or she had some days that she's been working on something else, or maybe was sick off for a day. Uh, unfortunately, because analysis was finished later, um, the developer, oh, he was just off the target for 66%. That's great. He is really a specialist. Like, I, I know that many project managers would be happy if developers would be just adding 60 something percent to the initial time. Mm, but he was not available, so the task had to work, wait for four more red boxes. And when the development was done, well, again, the test environment was used by a different team, so we had to wait. And then we started, but uh, yeah, the, the person who is testing, again, went for, I don't know, Kanban training maybe for a day, and he or she couldn't take care of it, so it, it lasted one more day. If you calculated the initial um, green boxes, it was eight days. And if we see how much of the network was actually done, so we calculate the green and yellows, we see that, well, it was not much longer. We see eight greens and uh, three yellows, so that's 11. Uh, that's not a big difference. Uh, but if we calculate everything, including the delays, weekends, sick offs, public holidays, whatever is behind the red ones, we will see that it's like 22 days. And so a big difference. And question is, what was the customer asking us about? And Kanban comes with metrics which are saying, well, this is not the, these are not the droids you're looking for, to use the Star Wars analogy yet. Yeah? To, to chase developers to, to find the answer to how many green boxes they are. What to do in this case? Well, what Kanban suggests is something that is, I would say, very counterintuitive for human people. So, well, we don't think and we don't forecast statistically. And because we do the knowledge work, how our work look like is uh, basically not something like this, that we see in many statistics scripts at the university, but our work distribution looks like this. So yes, we have some tasks which are taking quite short, they are on the left-hand side, but we have tasks which are taking quite long and it's not always because they are more complex or more time consuming. These could be the tasks that we put on hold. What did we put on hold? Well, because we started too many tasks at the same time. Yeah? So we are back to square two limiting work in progress. Or maybe knowing that we have uh, for some tasks dependencies and they will not go so fast, they will not go so smoothly. So we very often say that we are engineers, we very often say that we are data-driven companies, but we don't have such statistical look at our work. And there are a few misconceptions about it. So people say, you're right, Radek, but we don't have enough data to build such graph wrong. Uh, this is a knowledge work where you usually build new things. So if you wait long enough to, to have a big data pool, you will fool yourself because, uh, yeah, the system will change before you have a big pool of data. Um, then we have another opinion saying, well, on average, it's all going to even out. No, 
Uh, on average, probably yes, but if you don't have a normal distribution of work, like in the factory, you shouldn't use average. Let's use something different, a different metrics like 85th percentile. Uh, um, and one of, I would say, again, cognitive biases, how do we know how long something will take? Well, we ask the expert. Question is, is the expert going to do it in the end? Uh, is the same expert uh, who had a good day and the same expert who had a tough night with his crying children are going to be equally productive? And as at the moment that he was basically building the, um, the forecast. And <laughs> yeah, it's all great, but we are so special. Well, this is the only opinion, right? You, you don't know if you're special or not. And you don't know what influences the, the lead times, how long something takes to do in your work, uh, because we don't measure it. I'm saying for the industry. Yeah? When I, as a consultant, meet several companies a year, I very rarely see organizations who know how long it takes. Let's wrap it up. So what is, uh, what is this Kanban thing? No, it's, it's not just a board and it's not a sprintless scrum. It's a method to, to manage the knowledge work. Please pay attention, manage work, not micromanage people, not control people, but it's also a way to improve the way we work because this mission of improving the way we work is, is never ended. This is uh, something that lasts forever. Kanban is much more than just a board. So again, I'm gonna repeat it. Every time you hear from a team, organization, person that they do Kanban or they want to do Kanban, we should ask a question in response. What do you mean by Kanban? Do you mean just a board? Because that may not help. Do you mean a Kanban system, a full system, or maybe a method to manage it? Another misconception is that, well, we are in this false dichotomy. We either do Scrum or Kanban, or we do the traditional project management or Kanban. No. You can apply many Kanban practices to whatever you do, uh, to recruitment process, to marketing process, to sales process, yes, to IT, but to all type of professional services. And fourth of all, if you ever meet a Kanban consultant who will come and say, you all do it wrong, now I'm gonna tell you how to do it, then be aware because that's not Kanban approach. We rather say, start with what you do now, and take evolutionary steps, yeah? step by step to, to reach a better situation than you have now, which is again, not ideal after the first uh, few steps. It's never ideal. What does it mean in practice? Well, we have these practices, visualization, limiting work in progress, managing the flow, making policies explicit. So having clear rules and um, Unfortunately, for those of you who thought that Kanban will be some way of working without meetings, we introduce the feedback loops and the feedback loops are very often meetings. Um, but what is the spirit behind it is that we want to improve the way we work all together. So we improve it collaboratively and we want to evolve the way we work in experimental approach, just like in the scientific method. If you're interested in more, I encourage you to look for something like the official guide to Kanban method. It's available in multiple languages. I check that it's not available in Lithuanian yet. So I encourage you maybe to <laughs> go and translate it. Maybe you will make someone's life easier this way. Um, yeah, and uh, don't ever think again about Kanban as something that you do instead of something else and uh, think about, uh, yeah, what kind of problems we have. And uh, maybe they are far one of the four problems that I presented to you tonight. Uh, if, if the answer is yes, think about which Kanban practice could solve it for you, for your leaders, for your managers, for your team members, for your stakeholders, for your customers, because all of these people can benefit from it. Okay. I haven't looked at the time, if I was talking too long or too fast, uh, if there are questions, they are welcome. Yep, so uh, anyone who has a question and would like to ask a question live, uh, they are welcome to unmute and ask the question 
if you are shy and for some other reason don't want to speak up, we have a comment section, a chat. So use the chat. Hey, I have one question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a situation that I've encountered on a few projects. Uh, they're on the Kanban board, we use epics and stories, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but there are cases where an epic is not just a project, but an evergreen. Basically, mm -hmm. it's constantly getting more input, more tickets, to it, something that's not a project, but it will be constantly be done with, uh, within the team. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we move it across the board? Mm, OK. Yeah, uh, good good case. I mean, uh, maybe one one more uh, comment about what we should focus on the board uh, is that we should focus on the flow of, I would say, items which are understood by the customers as valuable. So if you have independent items like stories or epics or tasks, uh, whatever, that go from left to right, ideally, uh, and the, the customer, someone who, who orders these things, who's going to use the result of, of work, recognizes this as a value, then of course, this is what we want to optimize. Um, the way uh, that you described uh, using some kind of artifact like Epic to, to be a kind of, you know, just a bucket, endless bucket uh, for, uh, for some activities which are coming and going, to Kanban person sounds like this team who visualizes the board with, with this, this epic and the tickets linked to this epic is probably providing a service. Yeah? Service is again a Kanban word, right? So they, for example, continuously resolve the problems of, uh, I don't know, their own, different team, customers, and uh, maybe I don't know the context, uh, but the first, uh, I would say, solution which comes to my mind is instead of making them tasks of an epic, which is forever open, yeah, because then there is a problem like when to move it to the right, maybe it makes sense to design the board with a swim lane, so like a horizontal lane, where you would track just flow of the tickets that you usually link to this epic, because uh, I understand that the movement of these small items may resolve someone's problem and there is a value or at least learning or we could have a feedback from the fact that these tasks move from left to right um yeah that's that's the first thing which come to my mind i'm not sure um i'll, I'll give that if i got it uh, completely right but uh, yeah this is what we see that many often teams do they continuously provide a service to someone in the organization or outside and they try to make it a package which is very artificial yeah maybe mm. you should just embrace the reality yeah that, that's similar to what we have decided to do thank yeah. you happy happy to hear it mm -hmm. i have a question from my side uh you hit it quite nicely when you say okay so some people take the next ticket because it's less energy than going and helping others mm -hmm. to to move there and if uh, let's say this new kanban system is introduced and people developers or the specialists like you uh, said like have a habit of many many years mm -hmm. simply taking next thing so what would you suggest for them to like switching this mindset like what would be the first step for them to start mm -hmm. working more together Okay. Yeah, very good question. I would say, in the end, of course, you would like to replace the old habit with the new habit. How do we build new habits? Well, uh, there are, I think, two important conditions. One condition is to make, I would say, following the new habit easier than it is with the old one. And the second point is repeat the, old, the new habit. So I will uh, tell you the example of the team that I have worked with uh, actually earlier this week here in <laughs> Valencia. One of the developers said like, oh, when I finish or when the ticket is blocked, I need to start something else. What I call it is a false dichotomy of feeling like I need to start a new task. So we could, I would say, ease the, the anxiety, the, the, the fear, maybe a little bit by asking even at the daily, 
what is the next thing that you can do when you're finished with your current task, which is not starting a new task. Yeah? So, so giving the alternative, you maybe you want to be busy, great, but let's be let's make you busy with something that it's you know useful for the flow of work across the board, which may be dialing up for a call with a colleague to resolve his problem, which could be the doing the code review, which we don't, which we know that you don't like to do, uh, or, or maybe testing something, or maybe going to the product owner and uh, asking about items for next sprint or whatever, yeah, to do the refinement. So simply show people alternatives so they don't feel this anxiety that, oh, I won't have anything to do. Yeah. And my managers will see that I haven't locked the hours yeah? because this is very often what is behind the super strong habit that you're talking about, Christopher. Yeah. You got it quite right. So the anxiety comes when they say, oh, yeah. okay. So now it's in the review. I have nothing to do. Yeah. I would grab a new task. Yeah. All right. So thanks. Yeah. That, that was so and, and and you know ways to do it it really depends on openness of the people i know the team square for example having i don't know a voice uh, call on discord open all day long everyone is on mute so no one is invading anyone's home but the rule is that whenever i finish the task i unmute myself and i ask i just finished it what is now the best thing to do right and Anyone else from any one other location, home, office could then unmute themselves and say, could you do the code review for me? Yeah, could you help me with it? Because I tried paste, pa pasting everything from Stack Overflow and it doesn't work and ChatGPT doesn't give me the answer and I have no clue. Yeah? <laughs> oh, uh, Radek, don't take the question too seriously because I, all I want to do is just to put some fuel in the, into the fire. But... Sure. Uh, to wrap it up, I guess, um, um, the topic, um, what makes a board a common board? Ah, okay. I will answer with a little bit of a philosophical twist. I would say the real Kanban board should change over time. Uh, what, is, uh, what is, I would say, uh, strange, suspicious for me, is that uh, whenever the team decides to have a Kanban board and the Kanban board looks exactly the same if I visit them weeks or months later. So, you know, the same whip limits, the same columns, yeah, no new policies related to working with this board. That it means that we are in one of two scenarios. We either uh, landed in like, you know, happy land of uh, no changes in the universe I don't think we <laughs> we will ever do that, really. Or we haven't, uh, or, or we stopped improving. We, we stopped uh, looking if the Kanban board, the way we have it, is A, reflecting our reality, B, helping us, yeah, and, and all the things like that. That was good. I hope everyone enjoyed this uh, presentation and all the wisdom that Radek shared with us, just like I did. Um, sincere thank you, Radek, for 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 um, investing your time to spend a little bit a uh, little bit of time with with our community, uh, yeah, it was very interesting to listen to you. And thank uh, you, it's been pleasure. Without any further ado, I would like to hand over here to Vidas. Uh, Vidas is gonna present us another exciting talk uh, topic related to how to make a Kanban a proper Kanban. And yeah, Vidas, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Limonas, and uh, good good evening. Probably already good evening for everyone, uh, for agile practitioners. And uh, yeah, the, because I have some uh, time to comment uh, and and do my presentation, I will take a few seconds to really like support Radek. Very job, very well done. Enjoyed every bit of it um straight to the point and actually this is very advantageous because i can blast through my presentation without getting into details of explaining every bit and i will focus on on the meaty part of what i want uh, to do here um and, and maybe last reflection is uh, what is when do you know that it's a kanban board or not a kanban board i i know when it's not a kanban board if i see a board and there is one sausage one status piling up stuff so something's wrong it's not focusing on the flow right so that's not Kanban uh, at, at least for me but 
let's dive into the topic, which uh, I figured it's uh, why this topic is that I want to do a bit of a mission and uh, spark creativity and imagination of people who are either starting with Kanban or already doing a bit of Kanban. So they can see um, specific use cases of why would someone employ specific Kanban uh, practices at their line of work. And that's what I called it, uh, Arrow Kanban for Healthy Backlog. It will be a bit about uh, backlog and arrows. And, and the, this idea, the Arrow Kanban, it comes from um, one guy, Thomas Brandy, I think that's that's his first and last name. There's a blog post in InfoQ. You can read it. It's it's um, it's quite a piece. It has been written. It has been written already some time ago, uh, but very interesting uh, use case example. And it covers more or less quite quite a lot of I think more or less all of the essential practices. Um, but before we dive into that, uh, as as Lyman has suggested, a bit of introduction still about myself. Very very uh, excited to hear that we have International Community Day. Let's make let's make Agile Lithuania meetup, uh, Agile Europe meetup maybe eventually. Uh, so I'm Vidas Vasilauskas. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Teamhood. We are uh, software product developers. We are creating um, software which is called Teamhood, of course, and uh, it's very relevant to me because uh, our software is Kanban project management tool, and. I love analogies in Kanban, and for me, even in this picture, the swimming pool analogy, Kanban is, is a swimming pool with lanes where each card is a swimmer who needs to reach the finish successfully by going through all the checkpoints. Um, and we are creating software because we, we strongly believe uh, and we got fed up really with all the um, status quo of, of complexity because of powerful tooling. We believe everything can be done way, way simpler, way more faster. That's why we build uh, our software, which is a unique approach to actually the Kanban even itself. Um, and uh, it's fast, it's easy to use, and, and we want it to be flexible. So not only IT teams, not only techies can get it. And there is so much untapped potential in, in various uh, service companies, agencies, uh, government and uh, not uh, not all of them are like professional agile practitioners. Not all of those people um, have enough time or support or uh, cadence to do these changes or or get these values that we preach about. So so this is my mission. This is my business mission. Um, but I'll go back to my today's mission and go. And uh, let's see what why I am mentioning this backlog thing in arrow. Finally, so so so. Again, analogy of swimming, uh, when we aim to reach something, when we aim to do some uh, initiative, we have a goal, we want that goal to be uh, met successfully. And to, to, to do that, usually we do create backlogs and backlogs of things like steps, which we will take to reach that goal, that success we plan. Um, and it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're an IT company, whether you are a support team, whether you're a marketing agency, or you're just renovating your house. Everything has a goal, and that goal has a backlog. And when you swim through that backlog, uh, it needs to be transparent. It needs to be visual, so, so you don't, don't break a foot in there, um, and it needs to be clean. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, hopefully some of you are fortunate. I sometimes end up in this problem. You're, we're swimming through the garbage patch, not through the clear, clear, clear waters of nice coral reefs and, and colorful fishes. Um, and in this presentation, I will mainly be looking through the perspective of a person who I call backlog leader. Um, I'm a bit geekish here. Um, I try to invent one new term because uh, I want to stay away a bit from traditional role dis the descriptions. Probably the majority of you would, if I ask, like, um, so who, who is responsible for backlog or wh what is the role that you know who would manage the backlog? You might come up with people like product owner, maybe. Um, if it's not Scrum or Agile, you might come up with project manager who is still uh, governing the uh, breakdown. breakdown. Of, of work and schedule of work. So I thought, well, what if it's a support team? What, what if it's a marketing agency? What if it's a single professional? Well, I'll call them uh, that person a backlog leader. And backlog leader is special. 
um, because he really cares about the backlog. He has a goal to finish everything or some parts of the backlog, which are the most important. Yet that person has pains. And I kind of thought, so what, 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 what's the hurt? What hurts the most um, for that person? Luckily, I am responsible of at least a couple of backlogs myself. Not sure if that's a good thing to be responsible for a couple of backlogs. Ideally, it would be one if I had the choice in life. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of am responsible for at least a few. Um, and first thing that, that hurts me um, and uh, from my practice, uh, not only me, other people as well, is that we need to have like a reliable process um, inside backlog and outside the backlog when things come out. Because uh, we want to ensure that the process is repeatable. We reduce the risks. We maximize the chance of success if we if we have a step to take uh, towards our goals, we need to make sure that they are taken in the right manner with the right uh, approach, as well as I am, uh, what, what if I go on vacation? What if I break a leg? Who can come in and replace me? That's again, very important on the process level. It needs to be um, super fluid. It needs to have clear uh, policies defined. And yeah, as I said, transparency. Then another head hurt is, of course, backlog size. And backlog, backlog size can be not only head, but also butt hurt because uh, you might be sitting in 10 hour meeting just to go through the backlog. Um, th this is really annoying. And it's, it's number one challenge, not from day zero. You don't have that problem, hopefully on day zero, uh, but eventually you will. And the bigger, and it, it's really a degrading problem. The more items, the, 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 the bigger cost each time you need to go through it and work in it. And that's actually uh, like what is a garbage patch in our ocean. Oceans, unfortunately, they are growing. So another uh, tightly coupled problem and pain uh, is prioritization. Because first of all, the more you need to prioritize, the harder it is. Another thing is, how do you do prioritization of your backlog? And how do you elect the best items? How do you know what is the best? These, uh, these questions, sometimes they're neglected and uh, probably the biggest uh, and, and most common symptom of neglected prioritization uh, practices is people tend to pick work which is screaming the most, um, unfortunately, or, or, or uh, something that is burning and not sure why it's burning, how much it's burning, it's just because it's burning. And last, I thought like, so, okay, so these are like, some areas of your pains, what is like really, what really hurts all your head uh, all the time. And well, for me and, and for people who strive to reach their goals, I believe that's time to market. I, 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 I'm, I'm really skeptical if somebody says, no, we don't need today. We can do it later. We, 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 want, we want it after a year. That's fine. That's not how it works. And especially in business, especially in, in, in uh, services, especially in people who want to do a change, who has their own initiatives, who want to achieve um, success. So that's the problem space uh, that I will use to go into the solution space. And when we will speak about solution, about the scan man, I will use tools and practical examples. So first thing, which is a tool, also a practical example is prioritization pyramid. Um, no, no magic trick here. You just uh, create a triangle which has a couple of levels and you name them priority one, two, three. Uh, and the biggest, most, the most important trick of this triangle is that the higher it is, the less space you have to put something in there. That's the only trick. So it pushes you to uh, make it narrow and narrow uh, on each step of the priorities. Um, and it's to battle all these uh, offenders who always say so, hey, can you pick the most important task? And then somebody starts telling me two tasks instantly. And I say, no, if you have best friends, so is it one or 10 people? So if it's a, the most important task, it's also one. And, and then there are the rest of the things. Simple tool. Next thing, of course, we will have Kanban board. Come on, I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't about Kanban board. So yes, there is another tool uh, which we'll use. Uh, then we will use Kanban metrics because if I wouldn't use Kanban metrics, nobody would believe that we're doing a Kanban system. Probably Radek would, uh, would, would write me a letter of shaming uh, that uh, I even speak about Kanban without metrics. Um, and, and we'll speak about lead cycle, lead time, cycle time, and throughput uh, because this is very important. Um, and, and this is how you work uh, with Kanban. 
And it will also do a bit of fun. Of course, we'll have cake as a tool. Not sure if it's really a tool. It's it's uh, it's it's maybe a symbol of celebration. But we'll use it, and hopefully you can use it more often too, as well in your work environment. So let's start building. We know the problem space. We know the solution uh, pieces. Let's start building our uh, picture. And I chose Arrow Kanban as, as as an example of Kanban system because I myself and in, in my organization, we practice probably like I would say 95 plus percent of it. Uh, I really love because it demonstrates very well all the, all the techniques and it just sticks arrow Kanban. You, you, it makes you think like what, 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 what's, what's an arrow doing in Kanban? Ah, there is no big, um, there is no big secret. So it's a structure. And in Kanban, we also have structure by default. Um, we have like upstream Kanban where we uh, figure things out. It's, it's where you think about work, you think about priorities, uh, you refine what needs to be done by writing clear specification. Um, you refine by electing dependencies or discovering dependencies. It's kind of an analysis work, you might say. Uh, it's the part where we can have a freedom of deciding how, in which order, in what is most important, how it needs to be done or what should be done. Uh, and we still have a freedom to say no, eventually, even if we decided that it's important. And this is where we pivot our pyramid and we start drawing our arrow. That's, that's, the, that's the end of the arrow, by the way. Um, so this will be the input a feeding machine of work, which is already prioritized and neatly aligned in the queue. It's already using limits. Of course, in triangle, you have physical limits because of simple geometry. Uh, uh, but in, in, in reality, those will be uh, same concepts as limits in work in progress. You limit specific status. Your priority status is also uh, a thing to be limited. Then uh, there is a delivery board or, or delivery part, uh, aka downstream Kanban, where we actually commit to something. We commit to doing um, a change, a task, an initiative, a small project. We commit. Um, and uh, we follow a certain visualized, visualized process, which Radek uh, gladly introduced to, to us. Um, what it is, what is the Kanban board, what are the essence of Kanban uh, board um, aspects. And then uh, we will use small things here and there. Of course, whip limits must be here because again, multitasking is a thing to be avoided. We, we, we really need to be aware of it and we should focus on the flow and ensure that um, our system is, is running cleanly at almost like similar rate. So, so we can uh, have a predictable system or reliable process as they call. So we want to avoid that pain. It's a medicine to this pain. Um, and then we have the output, which is the tip, the tip of the arrow. It's our, it's, it's, it's the arrow that points to our goals. Um, and it's still what the original author of Arrow Kanban proposed. I, I really like the idea um, because this improvement point and when do you celebrate and when do you look at things, when you look at history and, and think whether it went well or not, um, it kind of needs a trigger. So in this pool-based Kanban system, what's a trigger? Well, we, you, it's not that easy to stand up and say, hey, let's do this or, or, or do something pre-planned like, oh, let's do every, every Tuesday or every end of the month or whatever, um, because not everything might be finished or, or you might be in, in the middle of something in, and you wouldn't be keen on doing this um, predefined meeting. So then the output status can be also limited and you can you can it's not straight away a number that you will think of but let's say if we are working on a project and and we have some amount of tasks uh, that we believe are the right for this project they will push us towards our goals and we can say maybe if we finish 20 that's already a good progress that's a nice step towards the goal Maybe you should celebrate. And then if 20 is fine, you put a limit of 20 on, on your output stream and you say, whenever we reach 20, we do a retrospective and we eat a cake. Of course, the cake. So 
these are the fundamentals. Three pieces, uh, simple techniques, trigger-based trigger retrospective and celebration, uh, prioritized and limited uh, input mechanism, and of course, a proper Kanban board itself. Then this is where I start putting a bit of sprinkles or fairy dust of, uh, well, it's not fairy dust. I, 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 I'm already over marketing it. It's just a bit of Vida's personal experience where I think um, emphasis is required. So few, few uh, additions based on my experience. And then this one, the expedite lane, it's still so natural to Kanban. And, and it's also in, in original post as a, as a next iteration, but be it, it doesn't matter what kind of thing you're doing. Either you're doing marketing, advertising, design, engineering, you're in a support team, you, you, you're in architecture, you, you are cutting here, serving tables, there will be incidents. I mean, come on, if, if, you, if you don't have incidents, do you really work at all? So incidents uh, is something that not always, but requires special attention. And I already mentioned the word burning. Well, if the house is burning, that's like really severe incident and, and we need to fix it first thing instead of continuing with um, uh, of things we do even. So some, some part of uh, switching over is allowed. An expedite lane is required for that because if we limit our board for regular classes of service, which we, we already got explained by Radek. And by the way, these tickets are col colored, of course, because of classes of service. Pink, red ones, they might be incidents, yellow ones, tasks, green ones, blue ones, initiatives, small projects, just a different symbolization of work because work of same type will be very useful later when we go to metrics. Um, but for now, let's focus on the expedite lane. And expedite lane, more or less, it should be reserved for things that are really have this taxonomy of value regression. I love how it's being presented by default, probably in all, all, all the Kanban presentations, that each class of service can be identified by how uh, the value behaves of that item being delivered over time. So if a house bur is burning, the sooner you extinguish it, the, the more value you gain. It means if it burns longer, you will lose value and, and loss of value in a burning house is extreme. It's exponential probably even. So, so expedite lane is kind of for those things that really lose value. Of no if you don't do something, the value diminishes very fast. And, and the, the rest of the things, they might be fixed deadlines, uh, they, they might be no deadlines, just a task that brings us closer to our goals. They can go with the regular process, with the regular Kanban board, um, with all the steps um, and all the limits altogether. Then another piece of, of this puzzle is very important, yet sometimes it's missed, I believe. And, and especially if you're not that into Kanban, not that... Um, geekish about uh, following everything to the every bit, um, commitment points. And commitment point is super important to the healthy functioning system because, as I've said, in the upstream, you kind of have a good, uh, good way of even avoiding doing some wasteful work because you're doing preparation, you're analyzing, you're figuring things out, you're trying to elect the best stuff, the best value that you should do. But if you commit to doing it and you will, um, you will spend time, your team will spend time on it. And maybe those people are, you know, the most precious resource you, you, you will ever have in your process because they're doing the real knowledge work, the complex part of it. Um, you, you must ensure that, uh, well, you don't waste that time with, with wrong things. And of course, things happen, but commitment point is, it's an agreement. It's a policy. If you cross it, you should you should finish it. You should finish the process. You shouldn't push back. That's why upstream Kanban can evolve into really a detailed refinement process where you have priorities as a late stage. But before that, you do a lot of prep work, and that would be fine. And that is required uh, altogether with another concept. Um, I haven't been working with it all the time. But 
I, 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 the more, the more we use it, the more I love it. I, if I look back at myself, like four or five years ago, I had really, um, far, far worse, uh, problem with dependencies. Uh, and usually that was the root cause why the work is being blocked or stuck. Um, uh, once it started and the best rule of thumb is, uh, of course, just, just for the sake of experiment to be quite strict, you can say, if we were to cross the commitment point, there should be no dependencies. We, we should have done such a good figuring out part. We should have um, refined so well that there are no dependencies. If there are dependencies, it must wait. It must be uh, pushed back and uh, redone or collect what's missing. If you need a design for your new web page that you will develop, well, you need to wait. You, you cannot start for it. Unfortunately, I, I'm not preaching this. Uh, I'm not a, a ideal uh, myself. I break this policy from time to time. And uh, I break it only when I see that I can fulfill the dependency myself when the work is started. It's not a good thing to do. It's just what my line of business requires me to do. Because in startup world, Either you're fast or you're dead. And, and the speed is the only weapon that you can employ to, to battle all these big Goliath uh, enterprise companies. So, so, but this is my line of work. I definitely doesn't, don't advertise. I'm just being completely um, transparent and honest with you. Uh, but it's a good, good practice. Say no to dependencies. Say, say no to work that has dependencies. Don't pull it in. Um, wait for it. And you will see uh, positive effects. Um, Pretty sure. Uh, then we move on to now finally the part where we, well, calculate something and, and maybe we'll start answering these tough questions when, uh, yeah, we created this nice Aero Kanban board, everything looks cool and, and, and playful, but uh, there are hard questions to be answered. And uh, still, as, as, as Radek did uh, explain in his presentation, people do have questions. When, when, when is something going to be done? When we will get the value? Customers might request uh, when their project is going to be finished because they order it a month ago and it's still not there. So very valid question. And we will do cycle timing uh, because we want to know how uh, much time do we take to deliver something when, once it crosses the commitment point. That's what I call cycle time in this board from commitment point to the finish line. Um, it is specific to each Kanban board. FYI, but usually it's about the work in progress when you really work on the deliveries. The second part is though, if somebody came and said, even, even in my line of business, so I get my nice backlog of things that I want to do, I call it the roadmap, I, I lay it out and then say, okay, we'll do these improvements to our product. And somebody, my customer will come in and say, hey, Vitas, you know, you, you, you said there will be this cool, amazing uh, chat GPT, uh, crypto, whatever, that free feature you will do in your product. Um, and you said, yes, we will do it. So, so when's that happening? And yeah, if you have the system, uh, that could be a tough question because they're like, what, 15 items in front, uh, they are higher priority, you will do those first. And then that, that, that one is maybe 16th, maybe it will be batched with something else. Um, so you kind of might be interested, what's, what's the time, how much time does it take for you from actual like inception of, of a thing, a change, an idea in, in, your, in your backlog to the delivery? And uh, it's not, there is no easy answer with single number. Um, also really uh, important part, what's the pattern of, of, your, um, of your lead times among different items? And one thing to help here is to separate by the class of service. Incidents will have their own uh, lead times, uh, tasks, standalone tasks will have their own, and maybe small projects or initiatives, they have their own on themselves as well. Because this way you will have more reliable, less um, fluctuating metrics. Then, of course, we will still have as an example, unfortunately, didn't make one, but still will refer to Radex presentation if somebody's uh, listening uh, to me now, they should rewind and, and look back uh, what is the uh, distribution graph of lead times. And of course, it's not going to be bell curve. Uh, I, I hate to break it down to you. <laughs> Rarely seen that happen. Uh, usually it's like uh, the, the long tail uh, diminishing um, scatter plot. Uh, maybe maybe 
uh, after the presentation, I would like to hear more who, who, what other patterns people see. But you need that uh, metric because you will use that metric um, to calculate and, predict and, and uh, provide your forecasts. The, and, and the last thing that everything that contributes to is the, the throughput. And throughput is very simple. How much things you finish during a fixed unit of time, be it a month, a week, a, week, a quarter, um, and, and how, many, how many items do you complete? Again, per class service, probably preferred if you work on multiple classes in the same board. Uh, and this will tell you if you finish 20 items in, in a month, well, maybe I can say with, with, with 85% guarantee, again, the percentiles, very good split to, to, make, not, uh, to make a better educated guess that 80% likelihood that we will finish this promised super feature um, in, 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 in at least a month, or it will take up to a month because it's, it's, uh, it fits in the batch of the first 20 items that are in the line. So this is, uh, this is what contributes and assembles the Aero Kanban and all the Kanban practices um, are, are presented as they are. Yet somehow uh, this looks very nice on the picture because um, it's easy to draw pictures in PowerPoint present presentations. When you think you want to do that at work, it's like, boom, how the hell do I do that? What, what, what's happening here? How do you make this picture into reality? And it's not, it's not uh, a myth. It's not some sort of um, unrealistic thing. I will just show you. That's why I made demo. Of course, I will show you everything in Teamhood because, uh, yeah, I'm super biased person here. But probably any tool that has uh, work in progress limits and essential Kanban structuring can adopt Arrow Kanban even without drawing pictures of arrows. So I'll just show you how it can be created and uh, how it will look. So I'll start by doing a Kanban board. It will be very fast, don't worry. Um, it's not much clicks I need to do. Um, what I need to do here is I will create my pyramid first of all. So what I need is like what? A couple of statuses which are called sort of in letters P2 then, and then we have P1. So that's my prioritization pyramid. Um, I will limit it, of course, to one, let's say, then the next one will be, let's give it a two, and the next one will be, let's give it a four. So it allows me to have more items in lower priorities. And maybe I'll just change a bit of coloring so um, it symbolizes something that goes um, from left to the right. Then I need my execution board. I will do one that I will call um, uh, work in progress. This is my committed. Um, I always forget how this word is written in English. Uh, please excuse me. And I will do a couple of more statuses. Maybe I will do to do then um, let's call something doing and then done. So this is my down, downstream Kanban. It's, a, it's like a sub process, the, the higher level process, which is consisting of three pieces, input, uh, work in progress and output. And then uh, my downstream is something more specific. I'm just doing stupid, simple thing here to do doing done. Um, it can be anything based on your business line. Um, and then of course, output and I'll put, yes, I want to limit that to my cake day. I'm not that, uh, not that uh, patient person. Let's say after 10, we need to have a cake most definitely. And last part, I need to limit my uh, work in progress. How many items do we commit at the same time? So three, let's say three is a nice uh, amount because maybe I have three people in my delivery team and, and that means they will, one person should work on one task at the same time. That's one part. So let's see how our board looks. So yes, I have my input, which is a prioritization pyramid, work in progress, three items allowed, output done. Then, I need to get myself an expedite lane, which will be serving uh, my incidents, which are really important to be solved uh, and, and at the burning speed. Yet another good finding is that this lane is the most abused lane or service class out of every, all, all of them, because once people learn that they can push things forward or pull things forward via this lane, they will do that. They will, they will abuse it and they will start calling things that are not incidents. They will start making things up just to get into this fast track. Uh, imagine Radek with his kids was going to the uh, airport and he has, maybe there is a 
special fast track only for people with kids. But then there's somebody is just bringing a doll because he wants to go to the through the fast track as well. But that's not right. So you need to have clear policies about why and, and how and, and in which cases the expedite lane must be used or should be used. And uh, I also suggest um, whether as a policy or if a tool supports limiting it, um, that you shouldn't have too many items in there. That's what I really prefer myself. It's my practical thing. I limit in here, I just said it, limit of three. I shouldn't have more than three things in here. If I have more than three things in here, something's happening. Something's wrong and it's already a trigger to, I don't know, look into our line of business. Maybe something changed. Maybe our quality standards became too low and we're producing problems instead of value. So, so these things, these work in progress limits, they're like essential tool in ensuring that we build a pull system, first of all. People will not push and pile stuff in the next status. No, once I'm finished, I will take the next thing or I will... As, as also been said before, I will look for help, to help my other colleagues so they can also free up and take on new initiatives. And, and then it's also about ensuring that people will use the system as it is expected. And there are other policies that you should clearly describe as a no dependencies uh, once the commitment point is crossed. And commitment point in here in, in our software is just a visual cue. There is a gap between statuses into another group. And that's it. That's a commitment point. And, and you can write a, a, a small uh, prescription like in here in the top to say, no, th this, this is where you solve dependencies. And this board then will serve me uh, as my transparent, repeatable um, process towards my goal. Uh, together with the policies, I will have my classes of service. Um, which will be also uh, these colors, colored sticky notes. I will uh, incident here, something's waiting. Um, I have my project. This is my small initiative that is broken down into smaller classes. If it's, um, if it's uh, something I want to start working, now I need to solve incident because limit of one. Let, let's, let's solve the incident, something frees up. Now this comes over. And if I have more people in the team, they will pull it in. And then once you pull in something, you can work on the downstream Kanban process. You can split, you can have smaller split tasks which travel on their own and finish their own steps. And once all of them are finished, let's do that quickly. You can call it a day. That's, that's your initiative successfully being um, checked off. You can start building your cake day uh, capital. And this is as it, it can be as simple as that, or it can be as complex as you will make it to be. But I just wanted to prove that uh, this arrow Kanban, it doesn't need to look like an arrow. This is just a simple uh, implementation of Kanban system. And uh, I guess uh, I will get back to my slides because the last essential message is there are many things uh, you can do out of Kanban practices. They really work well when you do uh, more of them together because each practice is uh, fulfilling the others or uh, helping other practices to bring and deliver the promised values of this approach, even like work in progress limits. So the, 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 always the counterintuitive part is that when, when you say to people, you know, the lower the work in progress limit, the higher the throughput. And it like explodes people's minds because like, wow, wow, isn't, shouldn't we doing, be doing 20 projects to finish 20 projects? Why should we do one by one? But that's how um, physics of work uh, and people uh, work. So thank you for listening. Go Kanban and relax. That's my uh, final two cents. And thank I you. Stop sharing. Yeah, thank you for presentation with us. So Lyman has already uh, left, uh, so I'm I'm taking over. And uh, yeah, so who wants to ask a question? Please unmute. I already saw Algirdas asking Algirdas asking the question. So I'll just rephrase. Uh, so what if you have a constant dependency? For example, your code needs to be placed in a platform which is owned by another team. What would you suggest? So, yeah, this is a, this is a ex external dependency that we cannot simply control. 
Um, it, for me, it would, I, would, I would model it simply as a built-in process step. So I would still have my own downstream Kanban as, as the point where I finish something and it's ready for the deployment. And if deployment is uh, governed or owned by external team or even organization, that's another step. We don't call that work finished, but my team can be done about it, put it into the queue of, of or parking lot, so-called, uh, that somebody else will need to deploy. So you, you need to model the process. Your board should have another extra, um, it's not like downstream step, it's still, it's still, it's still a stage, a higher level stage deploy to third party but it's not dependency which probably which you need to solve up front right you, unless you need to agree with when it will be deployed or you need to get um, get a permit to deploy uh, th then it's a hard dependency you, you cannot start working without a permit right so even in construction business so you, you need to get a permit to construct a building if you don't have it you shouldn't do it um, but yeah. with software, it's it's not a permit. You need. you you need somebody's time. So once you do, you 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 go next step, and then you park things. If things will start piling up in that stage, you will see that okay. So the process is hurting because our third party external team or or service is not delivering on the same speed or or at the same cadence as uh, as we do. Yeah, in our case, we do need change approvals from all involved parties in this mm -hmm. case which sometimes takes up to a certain amount of time to get all the approvals but we are trying to align with that specific team to have checkups regularly so they know what's coming from our side and they give us the information what kind of capacity they also have in their capabilities and and but but that's really it's it's totally awesome that you already have these like checkups and that's how you're trying to work around or solve um, the the impediments. And in Kanban system, first of all, you need you, if you're already doing that in Kanban, you're already visualizing the problem and and the problem um, is uh, is clear. You know who who you need to go to to solve the problem. If you're already measuring your throughput, you already know what you're capable of now. And you start these new initiatives, do weekly check-ins, uh, maybe try to involve more people from that team in, in your uh, prioritization activity so they're aware when they will need to dedicate their time. And it will speed up the things. So that, that's the essence. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Um, Veda's awesome presentation. Uh, especially love the part of managing uh, priorities with Pyramid. Definitely stealing this one. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> yeah, very cool. I'm happy. Uh, I, I have a question uh, about retro plus cake part. Like, would you sacrifice the regularity of retros over having a retro plus cake after agreed amount of output or items done? Would I sacrifice regularity? Um, uh, yeah. So th this one, you, you're. I'm. I'm not the one that uh, builds on the limit. Uh, runs the trigger of retro on the limit, unless it's really, really needed. Sometimes I can identify that by uh, other symptoms, not only by the finished work or maybe by unfinished work. So sometimes it's really uh, still trigger based, but. I am a fan of more predictable retrospectives. I don't say that uh, Arrow Kanban uh, should be burned, be uh, sh shouldn't be used because of that, because it offers another concept. Um, in, in the very beginning days, when we started creating Teamhood, uh, we, do, we did retrospectives on irregular basis, and that worked magic because it was very intensive period of figuring things out and we had to collect learning material before we can reflect on that learning material not only once not twice maybe 10 times before but once we got good and we solved re really big unknowns because when when you start building something from zero from scratch there is so much unknown um, your your head will break but once you get good at it, the regularity probably wins over irregularity, irregular things. That would be my two cents, of course. Yeah, okay, thanks.
thanks lucas so uh, any other volunteers to ask via voice or in chat i actually have one more question mm -hmm. which is not completely kanban but about metrics of kanban uh, some background our team currently manages kind of three services one is automation one is a tool for communication and another uh, is ansible it's basically a script running platform yeah I don't know if anybody has used it uh, currently we're trying to develop a level a, a report or a graph that shows how much time or workload we get for each category i'm trying to just think of a decent way to represent that data right now we just add labels to the work items but i don't have a good idea how to present this data uh month by month basis to show the, this information and i guess this um different um different scopes that you have they are quite specific to each other yes it, it if my first my fir in first thought right away is like yeah do you really want to merge fruits and vegetables into one basket and and try to present uh, on the same go or maybe you want to split them and uh, present each um, each one with their own specifics i hear that you want to present how much capacity you 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 dedicate to each one mm -hmm. um and that that could be solved probably i i did i did once with myself I, i'm just i'm not take it with a fine grain of salt i'm not now i'm not suggesting something i'm just speaking out my mind maybe you will um, catch something interesting so we 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 did ourselves before like t-shirt sizing and there, there well, so you can estimate things right you can estimate in hours you can estimate in story points or you can estimate in t-shirt sizes so both t-shirts and story points are nice story points are nicer when you need to go for let's call it i probably i will be stabbed soon because somebody will say vidas you shouldn't sum some story points that easily but you could if it's if it's a bigger amount like if we speak in sprints you can still sum some story points to calculate uh, your your um total capacity and total plan so it's still fine to some story points when you need to see, see how much you've done in specific work uh, unit uh, in specific time of unit which is a month right so you could do story points. And uh, unfortunately, I don't believe you will be able to sum the story points between different systems you own or these different contexts. But at least in one context scope, it should be possible. Um, and then you should be relaxed and say not more like three or four different uh, sizes of story points. A half, which is a trivial task. Everybody, everything is clear. Um, you can just do it right away. It doesn't take much time. One, which is probably something that's still insignificant, but uh, it just takes more time, but still everything is trivial and clear. And then maybe two and a three, where for, for, for more complex things, where you might have a question or two, you might need to do a bit of thinking, you, you might need to, to spend more time on, on it. And that's that, that would be your um, estimation measurement. And you would need to do those uh, for some time until you get good with the team uh, at estimating and then you can present that how many story points do you deliver per fixed unit of time i'm not saying uh you should go scrum sprints or whatever no just do estimations you can still do estimations that that's not not going to kill the system um but then you will be able to present those estimations per class of service per your system and then you will just need to educate people who are you presenting to what those story points mean. And those story points should be as close as possible to value. You, 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 should, uh, you shouldn't bring it up as value points. That these things, these things symbolize both uh, complexity, but also um, if we do work that is complex, it should be more valuable or it should bring value that we strive for in our goals or, or initiatives. So, so this would be like, my thought process to go towards the answer but it's not the answer it's the thought process um, if it was only one um, one type of, uh, of of work or one system that would be far easier but you wouldn't have a problem then right 
maybe Radha can uh, add in uh, a couple of more cents because I believe he's far more experienced in this question than I am. Yeah, I allowed myself to, to write um, a short note on it, um, but I can elaborate. Um, I mean, question is like, what do you like to achieve with this metric? I imagine that the easiest metric is to basically show the throughput or deliver rate. So like how much of each service you deliver within the same cadence. And basically, um, even if you do, you know, a lot of uh, short tasks for one type of service and maybe a few longer tasks for the other, um, the, it, looking at it in a one bar of different colors or something like this, uh, could lead us to the situation when we reflect, um, are we dedicating the right bandwidth of the team into the right service? Because um, I know from my experience, many cases where business comes and say like, oh, you don't deliver anything. I don't know what you're busy with. And they don't see that there is a different service, uh, for example, done for a different stakeholder that you do in parallel, which is of course competing for your team uh, team's time. And uh, especially if they have different stakeholders, then of course everyone is, let's just say, unhappy with how my requests are served, but they don't see that you serve the others, right? And um, yeah, this in my experience is a very good starter to, to look at it, mm -hmm. the team level and look also with the stakeholders, requesters. Uh, yeah, do we invest time in the right things? The, this is exactly what we are trying to solve. The, the recent problem that we solved more or less is the invisible work, because there was a lot of invisible work being done, which mm. got unappreciated mm. without notice or mm. anything. We switched from going to, you know, from two epics per month to now it's around 20 epics per month, because we started visualizing the work. And now we're just trying to see, okay, how much work we are actually doing on which technology or service or whatever. And do we need more people dedicated to that? Or do we, you know, want to split out that work? For the story points, I actually asked the team to drop story points and estimating. We do work in epics and we do work in stories. Yes, it's a bad idea, but we agree that one story should take at least in effort wise, one to two days max. If you need to do more work, you need to break it down into a smaller work. So we kind of dropped, but we kept the minimal size because the team is still kind of new to Kanban, Scrum, or whatever agile methodologies. But this way, they don't need to think. They pretty much can estimate their own work, how long they're going to take but it doesn't require you know discussing of is it one story point or is it five story points it doesn't matter just take create a story just do it if it takes longer create another story and break it down you you already sound like you're in very good uh, progress uh, both in making work visual transparent and then I believe you, you don't need like this magical silver bullet to to get everything right you need just to start somewhere and, and facilitate the discussion because bringing it up to the stakeholders, it doesn't matter which way you will bring it. As you said, you dropped story points, amazing. If it will work and it will spark the discussion that you do one things longer, other, one, other things faster, good. The stakeholders will start raising questions themselves and you, you will succeed in achieving your uh, evidence that there is so much things happening um, and some services get overruled by either shadow work or, or uh, other services, which are just screaming louder. So, so this is really, really, um, this sounds like a very, very positive uh, and most likely will be successful case. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the feedback as well. This was very useful to me. Thanks, Pleasure. Alexander, for question. Uh, actually, uh... I have one question myself, and Darren already uh, recommended a book, Making Work Visible. I haven't read the book, but the question still I'm going to ask is, especially in the remote context, and it's, it's question both for Radek and Vidas, so especially in the remote context, like I've heard that the board should be visible, like everybody sees the board, so make work visible. In the remote context, where would you place it, like how to 
make it visible. Like because if it's on Miro, maybe not everybody's like opening it every time or something. So what would be the best practices? I would place it only in team with um, <coughs> uh, slash advertising done. Sorry, had to do it. Uh, I would uh, build it in my routines and I would build it in my culture. So uh, it, it's it's very um, hard to figure out the technology behind such thing because you would, yeah, people think of these portal monitors of, of things that are always on, but uh, it's it's one way to solve it, of course. Yet, it's still in the manifest of agile, right? People over something, right? So, so, so it's it's still about culture over something, right? It's it's it it needs to be there first, and uh, I'm I'm a big believer of that uh, myself. And uh, I I usually by making work visual um, together with the team, we just build it into our. Um, I don't like the word routines, but we just build it in our way of working. And it, it, it happens uh, all the time. It's a daily thing. Um, we use it for facilitating our um, stand-ups or, or daily review meetings or whatever you call. We use it for retrospecting. We use it for ensuring that we deliver quality process and identify problems in it. So it's always there. It, it's, it's a tool that's being used. That's the that's important part. Thank you. I, I I may add something uh, yeah, maybe not uh, not obvious here, um, because of course if we have freedom to choose the tool, of course we should use wisely. Sometimes we are basically blocked by you know policies of our companies, customers, etc. Um, some months ago, I did an interview with Jim Benson, the creator of Personal Kanban, and and I think the interesting point was that even if you have a tool in which you track uh, the, the work of your project, your company, um, especially if you work uh, remotely, uh, maybe it makes sense to to still do the physical board, like super simple, um, because it gives the tangible uh, feeling. And and Vidas reflect like uh, refers to people and i would uh, refer to interactions yeah that um what <laughs> what what stops us from starting next task is is yeah uh, you know moving this small post it which is glued to your monitor or your <laughs> your wall in, in 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 the home office and reflecting okay what what now yeah again that's that's something that uh, may help yeah thanks my last last thought here would be I would also wouldn't start from the tool because if, if you have a very mature and professional experience team, you could do it. But in majority of teams and new initiatives, especially when new people come in to work together, where they don't know how they work together um, at all, it will be very hard because even if 1% of work, 1% of your team doesn't contribute to something because they don't believe in the culture, you will lose probably like 99% of the value because it will not be transparent. It will not make full picture. And, and that's why starting from the tooling perspective has very big risks.